So today we're going to talk about COVID. It's an RNA virus and this RNA virus is spread through close contact with respiratory droplets. So when someone sneezes or coughs or even talks loudly or sings, if you're within six feet from them and those particles reach your nose, mouth, or eyes, then you can catch it from them. It can spread through surfaces if someone's also left those droplets right on a surface and you either touch it or put that object like an eating utensil or a water cup that your child picks up from another child who's infected, you can also catch it that way. How do you discover that you've have, you have COVID and how long is that period? Oftentimes you may feel fine and then someone may reach out to you and say, hey, I just tested positive for COVID. And then you have to think about when your last contact was with them. The incubation period for most people before they develop symptoms is about five days. So you don't want to necessarily rush out if you just had contact with them the day before. Wait about five days and then do your test, five to seven days. If your test is negative from that exposure, you still want to stay in quarantine for at least seven days from the exposure date. And you need to self-monitor 14 days because some people still develop symptoms all the way out to two weeks. And by self-monitoring, you check your temperature morning and night and you watch for symptoms, which are cough, fever, even just 100.4, diarrhea, shortness of breath. I've seen a lot of teens present with sore throat and headache and fatigue as their initial symptoms before the cough came on. How does it affect a mother that's breastfeeding? So if you contract COVID, continue breastfeeding. You can take some precautions to try to keep it from spreading through the breastfeeding process by wearing a mask when you breastfeed, or you can wash your hands, wash your breasts off, pump that milk, and then let somebody who's not infected give that to your baby. Either way is fine. And there is at least one study in the WHO, World Health Organization, that showed a very low risk of transmission through the breast milk itself. And that was probably more of a contamination without poor hand wash. And you know, we love to sing to our babies while we're nursing them and it can spread it that way. So just keep that mask on while you nurse for 10 days from your positive test. What about like a vaccine? I know people are getting vaccines, but some people are still breastfeeding? They're like, do I get the vaccine? Or how does that work out? Great question. I've been vaccinated. So glad to have that available to me. And I hope everyone else who qualifies for it can go ahead and get that done. The breast milk is fine for your baby after you're vaccinated. So there's no live virus in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, the mRNA vaccines that are available right now. And so it's not harmful for breastfeeding or for pregnancy. And the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, ACOG, they recommend that pregnant and nursing moms go ahead and get the vaccine. Is there a shot that we've had previously just as adults that has something live in it that's something comparable? Right, right. Some of the vaccines like your measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox vaccines, varicella, those are a live form of virus. They're weakened, so you won't get severely ill from them as long as you're a healthy person, but they do have a potential to cause symptoms and to have some live virus in your body. And so we do not give pregnant women women, measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox vaccines while they're pregnant, since that could potentially pose a risk to the unborn baby. The aborted fetal cells. Can you kind of talk about that? I don't even know where to start with. Yeah, that's a hot topic and it's very <laughs> complex, but I'll just focus on it with the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines that are available right now, which are Pfizer and Moderna. So those vaccines are not made with fetal stem cells. Those vaccines are tested on a fetal cell line that was established in 1973 from an aborted baby girl. So yes, they're tested on that before they were released for the phase one clinical trials on, you know, to the general population to make sure that they were effective and safe, but they are not manufactured and they do not contain fetal stem cells stem cell lines in the vaccine, and they're not manufactured using those stem cell lines. What about the difference between Moderna and Pfizer? Side effects are very similar. So both of them are 95% effective at one week after the second dose. That means 95% of the people will have a level of neutralizing antibodies that will keep them from catching 
COVID-19. Now there's still a 5% chance you might be in that group where you're not immune based on your vaccine. And then now we have the South African variant that's going around that looks like it may not be covered as well by the vaccine, but that's still to be determined. So even though you get vaccinated, you still want to go ahead and wear a mask and do social distancing and take cautions because this is an ever daily changing virus. Both of them reach levels of neutralizing antibodies to protect you. Pfizer seems to have a little bit stronger response. Some people have said they get more side effects because the vaccines are only spread out by three weeks compared to four weeks for Moderna, but both are effective and safe. If you get the vaccine, is it possible that you develop COVID or that you start having really serious flu-like symptoms? That's a great question. So you cannot catch COVID-19 from the vaccine because it's not a live virus, but some people do get pretty significant symptoms after they take the vaccine. We call those side effects in this case, since it's not actually an infection. It's a sign that your immune system is mounting a really great response against the vaccine. And those side effects for most people are just soreness at the injection site. I got that with mine. Headache, fatigue. Some people do get fever and body aches and feel almost flu-like for a couple of days, but that is not the COVID illness itself. Kids can't transmit it as quickly or as often as adults can. Is that true or? That is true. And what we're talking about here are young children, generally children less than 10. Their immune system mounts a really awesome response to the virus and they are much less likely to transmit the virus than teenagers and adults. So the younger your child is, the less risk of transmission, also the less risk of symptoms. So I personally have seen quite a few young children that were bouncing off the walls in my exam room and they were COVID infected. They looked fine, except perhaps maybe I saw a little red throat, a little bit of lymph nodes in their neck that their parents hadn't even noticed. What we have to be concerned about is if they are sharing drinks and kissing and hugging on those grandparents, that's pretty close contact and they could pass it to their grandparent. I recommend three and above to wear a mask when they're around elderly or people outside of their immediate family and household. What age can you start using hand sanitizer? You can actually use sanitizer even on little babies, but you want to be sure it has a chance to dry before they immediately put that fist to their mouth. And then there's been some concerns about the sanitizers that are made in Mexico having methanol in them. So check where that uh, sanitizer is made. Ethanol-based hand sanitizer. As long as it dries before they put it in their mouth, <laughs> they'll be fine. Is there anything else that we should keep an eye out for or think about when it comes to COVID? I have been asked many times by people about the children, and even though their symptoms are mild, are they going to have risk for long-term heart problems, and should the little children get vaccinated? So that topic is definitely controversial because we don't have long-term data on COVID in young children. But so far, what we know is in adults who are hospitalized with COVID, only about 5 to 20% show evidence of an acute cardiac injury. And in little kids, the hospitalization rate and severity of illness is so little that we're probably not going to see major cardiac issues for children less than 12. And that's also why the vaccine efforts have been for 12 and above. I don't know when or if vaccines will be available for less than 12, but really they're focused on the people who would get more serious complications long-term.